Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our teacher workshop today, The Rise of Hate and Anti-Semitism in the Pacific Northwest. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Director of Education at the Holocaust Center for Humanity. I wanna take a moment to also introduce my colleagues who are joining us on this call. Paul Regelbrug, our Professional Development and Curriculum Coordinator. Rosa Campos, our Education Assistant, and Julia Thompson, our Education Resource Coordinator. I also wanna thank Richard Green, our Museum and Technology Director, who is helping us behind the scenes. It's wonderful to have so many educators with us today from a variety of backgrounds and from across the state. I encourage you to please use the chat and Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen throughout the seminar. At the end of the program, we will include a link in the chat for a short survey. We will also email all this information along with the details for the one clock hour you can earn at the end of the program. At the Holocaust Center for Humanity, we have been very busy these past few months transitioning existing programs to online platforms and creating new programs and resources to meet the changing needs of teachers and students. There are three programs and resources that I want to quickly highlight. Our Lunch and Learn presentations on Tuesdays at noon. Every Tuesday at noon, you, your students, and their families have an opportunity to tune in to hear a speaker. This past week, Mahal Latskar, the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, shared her family's powerful story. And this next week, on Tuesday, we have scholar and author Dr. James Waller discussing the importance of genocide prevention during the pandemic. You can catch up on previous presentations or see what's coming up on our website. Number two, our Virtual Speakers Bureau presentations. Our Speakers Bureau, survivors and the children and grandchildren of survivors, are sharing their stories with students virtually. Yesterday, Holocaust survivor George Elbaum spoke to 300 students at Islander Middle School on Zoom. If you are interested in scheduling a presentation for your students, let us know or click on Speakers Bureau on our website. And thirdly, our new online platform of best practices. Last year, new legislation was passed supporting Holocaust education in Washington State. As part, of, as part of this directive, the Holocaust Center has created a new online platform of best practices. This easy to navigate resource is like your own personal search engine for finding reputable and reliable lessons, activities, and resources on the Holocaust and its enduring lessons. We have selected some of the best lessons created by experts, including Facing History and Ourselves, Echoes and Reflections, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, the ADL, and others. We will be launching the new platform in the late summer to help you prepare for next year. Stay tuned for more information on that. In the past year and a half, I have received more phone calls and emails from parents, teachers, and students about anti-Semitism and racism in the schools than I have received in all of my 17 years at the Holocaust Center combined. This disturbing trend has been seen and felt around the country. As the pandemic spread across the world, our news and focus has shifted, but attitudes have not changed. Just the opposite. In times of stress and economic crisis, hatred, stereotypes, and anti-Semitism flare. The Anti-Defamation League has been at the forefront of tracking these trends, reporting on them, and identifying ways to confront and counteract such attitudes. We are lucky to have with us today Kendall Kosai, Associate Regional Director of the ADL Pacific Northwest Region. Prior to working with the ADL, Kendall was the Deputy Director for the OCA Asian Pacific American Advocates and a senior reporter at the North American Post, the largest and oldest Japanese American newspaper in the Northwest where he wrote stories on topics such as civil rights, healthcare, and politics. Thank you so much, Kendall, for being with us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Alana, and uh, welcome everyone to uh, today's webinar. I'm going to start by sharing my screen and starting the presentation. So again, um, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, you know, I think this is a very timely topic, especially as we see a rise in hate across the Pacific Northwest. Um, because I know we're in a uh, room full of educators today, um, I wanted to create a uh, interactive component um, because I know how difficult it is, uh, especially during this teach from home time to keep uh, your students engaged um, and interested in the content that you're delivering. So. 
um, hopefully today is a is a great opportunity um, to not only uh, learn a little bit about the state of hate here in the Pacific Northwest, but also um, you know engaging and have a, engage and have a conversation about what's happening in your school. So um, before we get started, uh, there are some instructions on uh, your slide on your screen that you should be able to see. Um, which include um, logging into our interactive platform uh, that we're going to be using today. Um, it's called Poll Everywhere. So if you go to the website, you can log on to it on your computer or your, your cell phone. Um, you can go to pollev.com, enter the code Seattle ADL670, um, and then enter your name, and you will be ready to go to answer the questions in the subsequent slides uh, that I'll be presenting. So, you know, just um, as a getting a sense of who's in the room today, um, I wanted to start out um, by uh, asking the question, why did you choose to join today's webinar? And what the responses here will generate is essentially a word cloud of uh, things that uh, folks feel um, and type into their phones or the browser, um, again, using the above um, URL code. So again, feel free to share what, uh, why you chose to join today's webinar. It could range anywhere from um, learning a little bit more about anti-Semitism and hate in the Pacific Northwest to finding out what kind of resources that, that uh, are available. And uh, the word cloud is generating live right now. So um, you know, obviously there are some trends. The bigger the word, the bigger, uh, the more often that the word has been inputted into the system. But again, um, it seems that community and concerned um, seems to be a strong trend in today's webinar. Um, I am going to go to the next slide. And as we see more and more uh, answers come in. So the next slide is, again, trying to just really figure out who is in the room today. So there should be a map on your phone or your computer. And if you could just click, where are you participating in this webinar today? I know there's a good number of folks that are participating here in the Puget Sound region, but we're also looking for folks that are in other areas too. Hey, Kendall, this is Alana again. Yep. Can you, we have a Alana. question, can you reshare the password on how to get in? Sure. Can you show that slide again with the link and password? Yeah, sure. So um, the password is up here um, at the very top of the screen. Um, it's it's pollev.com slash Seattle ADL 670. Um, and so that uh, should bring you to the appropriate site if necessary. It looks like a good number of folks again are in the Puget Sound region and um, maybe a few down, one in Oregon and a couple down in the southern part of Washington. So um, wherever you are, thank you for joining today. So um, again, because I know this room is full of educators, I wanted to go over the program uh, agenda and objectives um, for what we're going to be going over today. So going to give a quick overview of ADL. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the state of hate here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the resources that are available to educators and then we'll field some questions um, that people may or may not have. Um, so hopefully by the end of this you'll be able to learn a little bit more about hate here in the Pacific Northwest. We're going to examine why checking hate incident, incidents of hate matters and of course talking about the resources. So a little bit about ADL. Um, so ADL is a national civil rights organization. Uh, we have uh, regional offices across the, 23 regional offices across the country, but we're primarily, uh, our main office is headquartered in New York. Um, our Pacific Northwest office is located in Seattle, uh, downtown Seattle, but we represent five state, uh, five state region, including Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Alaska. Um, so anything, any incidents, anything that happens in those areas, um, ADL Pacific Northwest deals with those issues. Um, our mission is, when we were founded over 100 years ago, is dual. Um, first, to stop the defamation of the Jewish people, but also to secure justice and fair treatment for all, because we believe that um, true uh, liberation and equality cannot be achieved without um, securing justice and fair treatment for everyone, not just, not just the Jewish people. So, um, and this, this mission still rings true today um, in a spirit of allyship and community engagement. 
So we do our work in a couple of different ways. Um, so the way that we kind of look at it is um, we advocate, educate, and engage. We advocate for policies. We advocate for um, issues that matter to our community. We educate. We work with K through 12 schools, colleges, universities um, on anti-bias curriculum, and then we engage the community on these really important issues. All of this goes down, filters down into the overarching theme of fighting hate for good. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what the state of hate in the Pacific Northwest is like. Um, so uh, there have been several high profile incidents, um, especially recently um, here in the Pacific Northwest uh, that have included some kind of hate incident or hate crime uh, that was committed. And we're seeing a lot of bias incidents, not only um, in our communities, but also our schools. And oftentimes we talk about how schools are often a microcosm of society. Um, they represent uh, what is happening um, across our communities and, um, and educators are often on the front lines of dealing with these really touchy and, and difficult issues. Um, so, uh, hate and bias incidents. So what is a hate uh, and bias incident? Um, so, you know, a hate and bias incident is any hostile expression that may be motivated by a person's race, color, disability, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Um, but the act does not necessarily need to be a federal, state, or local crime, right? So it, uh, and a hate crime could is essentially um, when a crime is committed with a bias motivating factor to it. Um, but a bias incident or a hate incident is not necessarily a crime in itself. So this could be something like shouting at someone on someone shouted you at you on the street telling you to go back to your country or um, blaming you for um, x y or z or spouting off conspiracy theories about it. because of the first amendment free speech that is not a crime in itself it is a biased incident um, and what we would consider harassment right and so again you can see examples of hate and biased incidents you know, again, name calling, racial, ethnic slurs to identify someone using degrading language, creating racist or derogatory graffiti or images uh, or drawings, th those would be a biased crime. And then imitating someone with a disability or imitating someone's cultural or norm practice. So, um, again, get your phones out here um, and the link will pop up again uh, at the top. Um, and this is just uh, a question. This, this actually has a definitive answer to it. It isn't very open-ended. But how many hate crimes were recorded by the FBI in Washington in 2018? So um, as the results come in, the FBI does a uh, data report every year um, for the previous year of number of hate crimes that happened um, in each state. Uh, and this is because of the Hate Crimes Act of 2009 where they're required to collect that data. Um, but again, these are hate crimes that have happened in Washington state. So in 2018, and this, this report came out in November of last year. So I see the majority of folks say 506 uh, with a uh, descending amount of responses on D, C, and D answers, and obviously zero for A. So the correct answer is actually E. Um, 506 incidents were, perpetrated last year, hate crime incidents were perpetrated in 2018 uh, in Washington state. But you know, Washington state is not alone in terms of um, being a victim of hate crimes. Uh, so there were 118 in Oregon, 23 in Idaho, seven in Montana, and seven in Alaska. When we talk about the number of hate crimes um, across the Pacific Northwest, um, these numbers are not absolute, right? They are um, just a small snippet what is actually being reported to law enforcement because of a number of different community trust issues with law enforcement um, you know hate crimes are, are not always reported to them and therefore the data is not captured so um, we believe that these numbers are severely underreported in terms of uh, what actual what the actual reality is um, so again uh, while there are 506 here in washington state we know that's not the full scope. In fact, a city of over 100,000 people uh, federal way, or not, not 100,000 people, but the city of federal way in 2018 
um, which has tens of thousands of people in their city reported zero hate crime, right? And, and we know that's not necessarily true because we know hate incidents and hate crimes that have occurred that have been reported to ADL. So um, again, severe underreporting. Washington State, in fact, is the uh, third highest per capita number of hate crimes uh, in the entire country. Uh, we rank the number three among all 50 states, which is quite startling given um, you know, the size of our state and the, the frequency in which it happens. But again, um, it's something to keep in mind moving forward. We think of the Pacific North as, Northwest as this, this, um, you know, this, this fashion of inclusivity and understanding, um, but oftentimes we, we forget that there is actually a strong contingent of hate groups that exist here in the Pacific Northwest. Again, um, you can see the trends that go from 2009 to 2018 um, in terms of the number of uh, hate crimes here in, in Washington state. Um, 2017, it seemed to have peaked um, with 2018 very closely behind, but again, a very startling trend here in the state. And again, the types of hate crimes that happen here in Washington state are very disturbing as well. The majority of them being actually based on race, ethnicity, and origin. Um, and right behind that um, and making the switch in 2018 was actually a hate crimes based on sexual orientation. Um, so uh, obviously it is a very disturbing trend. And again, some local, local statistics analysis um, here is that, wa again, Washington has the third highest number of hate crimes per capita. Um, Washington state actually has the fourth highest number of hate crimes overall. And hate crimes based on sexual orientation increased by over 30%, up from 79 in 2017 to 106 in 2018. So um, again, um, very uh, comprehensive in terms of the way that we look at hate here in the Pacific Northwest. But again, we know that the numbers do not represent the full picture of what is happening. And so, you know, again, um, and, and you know, we we talk about. Washington being the third highest number of hate crimes per capita, but that but that might not necessarily be true um, in an overall uh, sense because uh, Washington State actually has pretty good uh, hate crime reporting laws um, for law enforcement, and we know that here in the Seattle region, especially, uh, law enforcement takes these crimes very seriously. Um, Seattle is actually one of the the top leaders in the entire country in uh, hate crime reporting. Um, uh, to the, the FBI. So um, take out your phones again because we're going to ask another question just to make sure you're still awake during the presentation um, to see, to kind of do a, a climate in your school uh, assessment. So how often are you seeing bias and in incidents in your school, right? And again, going back to the definition, this could, this doesn't necessarily need to be crime, doesn't need to be physical assault, it could be harassment, um, it could be anything from verbal harassment. Uh, it could be uh, very slight um, bias incidents that folks may or may not see or recognize as bias incidents. And so, again, I'll give you a little bit more time, but it appears that sometimes um, seems to be the uh, most often uh, answer here with about 53%. Um, 32 percent often and then 15 percent every day and so what's noticeable about these responses is that there are no no one has responded that there are never bias incidents in your school um, so we'll move on to the next question right um, and this is kind of an open-ended question and again all all your uh, answers are anonymous but what kind of challenges are you do you have with bias incidents in your school right is it um, that the that administration doesn't take them seriously? Is it that um, students can, uh, don't seem to have uh, an understanding of the scope of the issue? Is it that we're really trying to, to we, you don't have enough programs to create anti-bias leaders? It could be a number of different issues. So we're seeing a number of different answers populated onto the screen in live time. Again, it says teachers remain silent, they do not interrupt homophobia among students, um, only hearing reports of them and not seeing them in action, kids don't think they are that serious, white cisgender administration, lack of diversity, denying, not taking seriously enough. So I, I'm feeling a little bit of a, a theme here 
in terms of you know a, a sort of denial or a misunderstanding or uh, a lack of uh, accountability right um, that are that's happening in schools and so you know I, I think this this resonates with uh, ADL in particular because on a, a pretty frequent basis we as an organization do receive a lot of reports that um, are being said that are being responded here on the screen in terms of administrations not taking action in terms of uh, you know educators not knowing what to do necessarily as the first step in terms of students um, not understanding um, the implications of their actions or um, you know the lack of accountability um, reporting lack of reporting even though we know that it's happening so again a plethora of challenges that we're seeing in our schools and i and i do say i do appreciate folks being uh, open and um, candid about um, the issues that they're seeing challenges that they're seeing in their school and again um, as, as answers continue to roll in i think it just uh, demonstrates the scope of what we're seeing i'm going to move to the next slide here so um Again, this is, these are some data statistics in terms of um, what, what a school climate report that was put out um, in 2018 said. Um, Teaching Tolerance uh, is an organization that does these kinds of reports uh, and provides curriculum around um, anti-bias education and ADL oftentimes works with them and, and um, does studies with them, but they did a hate at school report in 2018 that said that two thirds uh, educators witnessed a hate incident or bias incident. Um, it appears that racism appears to be the motivation behind most of the incidents. Um, and anti-Semitism were the most likely to be reported in the news media. Um, you know, anti-Latinx and anti-LGBTQ incidents were actually the least likely to be reported to the media. And again, most of the hate incidents, bias incidents were not addressed by school leaders. Uh, by the administration. No one was disciplined 57% of the time, and nine times out of 10, administrators failed to denounce the bias or reform, reaffirm school values. So to that, um, you know, we obviously find that to be a very um, challenging report, right? And it clearly shows that our work is cut out for us. ADL does its own report, right? Every year around anti-Semitism, um, in schools. Um, we just came out with our annual audit of anti-Semitic incidents. And, and you can see that um, in 2019, you know, there were 411 incidents in K through 12 school, anti-Semitic incidents in K through 12 schools in 2018, um, and down from 200, 457 in 2017, uh, which was the highest year ever. Um, but again, we, we separate it by harassment, vandalism, and assault. And these are reports that are directly um, sent to us that are in the news. Um, but again, doesn't capture the full reality of what uh, educators on the ground are seeing. And it's quite disturbing that, again, anti-Semitic incidents against um, Jewish individuals are is on the rise. Even here in the Pacific Northwest, we're seeing some serious local school bias incidents. Right, and, and um, you know, one incident, two students posed for a photograph displaying a Nazi salute. Um, and another incident, uh, a racist prom invitation said that if I was black, I'd be picking cotton, but instead I pick you. Um, and that prompted a school walkout um, at that school. Uh, also locally, a video circulation when a white student using a slur and advocating for black people will be hanged. You know, the, the normalization of hate in the Pacific Northwest is uh, very disturbingly high. Um, and again, we see incidents like what's here on the screen and in the photo, um, you know, quite frequently that's reported to, to our office here in the Pacific Northwest, right? Vandalism, swastikas carved into trees, into benches, comments that are made towards students, not, uh, you know, in, in the school and, you know, we're, we're our, acutely aware of the challenges that students are, are facing and how do we support them really, right? Um, we're also seeing a lot of propaganda here in the Pacific Northwest as well. Um, there are a lot of hate groups. Um, you know, the, this one is by the Daily Stormer Book Club that spreads propaganda not only, um, you know, in our communities, it, it spreads it on synagogues and it spreads it on our school buildings. And, um, you know, they're thinly, they're not necessarily um, overt 
in their racism, their sexism, their misogyny, uh, but it, it is very clear their intent. So um, obviously the, the flyer on the left is very um, uh, you know, horrific and, and is very clear in their intent. Um, but these, these two posters were hung around our communities here in the Pacific Northwest in the Snohomish and King County. Um, and, you know, as, as we see these, the rise of organizations like the Daily Supported Silver Book Club, Patriot Front, um, you know, a number of extremist organizations um, here, in, here in our communities, it becomes more normalized. And how do we fight back and how do we push back against these kinds of things that happen? The last thing I want to uh, talk about in our in the state of hate here in the Pacific Northwest is um, hate symbols. Um, I know there are a lot of symbols out there, and a lot of them have like dubious or ambiguous uh, meanings to them. Um, but ADO does uh, offer a uh, resource to everyone uh, called Hate on Display, which is our hate symbols database. Um, it goes from anywhere from swastikas to iron crosses to nooses to whatever it is um, to show what the intent behind some of these symbols are. So if you see something, you're not exactly sure what it is, feel free to reach out to us, feel free to go to the hate symbols database and kind of look it up and, and explore and figure that out. I think we got a number of different uh, requests last year in particular around the OK symbol um, being a white supremacist symbol. Uh, and, and there was a lot of media that was generated around it. And, it's, and a lot of educators actually reach out to us because I know a lot of students play the OK game or which is also known as the media look game. Um, and they were wondering, is that a white supremacist symbol? Should there be some kind of recourse of action? Um, but you know, the answer that ADO typically gives is that uh, it depends on the context. Typically students are not using it in a white supremacist context. Usually they're using it in the made you look game. But again, um, it, it has been, co the okay symbol has been co-opted by white supremacists to be used uh, to spread uh, white, uh, white po the white power message that they often um, seek to spread. So um, again, this, this resource is free for educators to use on a daily basis. So here is another question for you, just to make sure you're awake um, here during the presentation. And I believe this is a short answer question, um, but how would you describe your school, or it's actually a word cloud, sorry. How would you describe your school's willingness to engage in anti-bias initiatives? All right, so again, the bigger the word, the more popular the answer, um, but I'm seeing, um, Perhaps some question, some answers, lip service, moderately, slow, some are willing, um, diverse, investigating, open-minded, lukewarm. So there is a diversity in answer and there is a willingness, right? I think the, there is a willingness for schools to be engaged in these really, really um, difficult issues that sometimes they have no idea where to even start. Um, and, and I do applaud schools that want to take that first step um, in recognizing that there's an issue and recognizing that there is a need for diversity programs. There, there's a need to create anti-bias curriculum. Um, and again, I appreciate folks um, being so open and candid and, and submitting the responses to this, this question. So that really comes to the crux of our, our question here today is what are we doing to prepare students to become anti-bias leaders? and face these community challenges, right? So ADL's approach is uh, kind of, it, it, it's um, fourfold in terms of the way that we approach this. So we believe that bias uh, is universal, that all people have developed biases through socialization, education, exposure to print and broadcast media. Um, although the specific biases held by people may vary from person to person, bias is a precursor um, to prejudice, pre prejudicial thinking and is a powerful influence on everyone. We also believe that change is a process. Change is sometimes a difficult and slow process, which makes progress difficult to measure. And we know that in schools more than anything. Um, we also believe that diversity is a strength. It's not a problem or challenge that cannot be faced. Um, diversity is what makes us stronger. And then, of course, prejudice, just as pre prejudice is learned, therefore, it can also be challenged and overcome. It can be unlearned because, um, you know, pre because uh, we believe that when you shine a 
bright light on these issues um, that you can, it really serves as a disinfectant against tape. So ADL likes to use what's called the pyramid of hate. Um, you know, the pyramid shows biased behaviors growing in complexity from the bottom uh, to the top, right? So at the bottom, we see biased attitudes. These include stereotyping, inconsistent of remarks, et cetera. Um, right above that are acts of bias, right? So, so attitudes change to acts. Um, this includes bullying and ridicule, ridicule and slurs and name calling and microaggressions. Um, but bias acts turn into systematic discrimination, right? Whether it be economical, political, educational, employment or housing. And this discrimination leads to violence. Violence, things like um, going as far as murder, rape, assault, arson, threats, terrorism, vandalism, and desecration, right? And at the very top of the pyramid is genocide, right? The act or intent to deliberately and systematically annihilate an entire people, right? And although the behaviors at each level negatively impact individuals and groups, as one moves up the period, pyramid, the behaviors have more life-threatening consequences. Like a pyramid, the upper levels are supported, right, by the lower level. And if people or institutions uh, treat behaviors on the lower levels as being acceptable or normal, uh, it results in the behaviors at the next level becoming more accepted, right? <coughs> so that's, that leads us to our next uh, slide, which is around the pyramid of allyship, right? How can we fight um, these different levels of hate? Um, what can we do? Where do we have the power to help, right? Um, and I believe, and what we have seen, is that one of the biggest and best things that we can do to stop the pyramid of hate is with our young people. Uh, if we can get to kids, we can actually make change. So I'd like to share a little bit about what ADL is doing to build these out, right? And let's see here. There we go. Okay. So, um, what ADL has is actually a program called No Place for Hate. This is a K through pre-K uh, through 12 school initiative um, on combating bias, bullying, and hatred in an effort to create equitable, inclusive, and safe communities in which all students can thrive. Um, so 1.2 million students from across the country in 1,700 schools have learned to use the power of positive peer influence to take action against bias and bullying in their schools. And this is a uh, student-driven initiative um, that ADL works with schools on um, to make your school safer, to create activities um, that, that uh, make an impact and create anti-bias leaders. Uh, and it directly impacts thousands of students through dozens of student-driven activities throughout the entire year. So this year, we had about 25 schools um, reaching about 25,000 students. But across the country, we've reached 1.2 million. ADL also offers a world of difference workshops, is what we call them. Um, different from uh, No Place for Hate, which is uh, free to schools, a world of difference workshops actually come at um, a little bit of a nominal fee. Um, we have teacher anti-bias workshops and curriculum that we provide, um, but we also do peer to, uh, leadership programs or No Place for Hate, Hate committee trainings that are in person as well. Um, so if folks are, interested in either of those, um, we are definitely open to doing so. The peer leadership program um, is a half day to three day pro program equipping students to become leaders and agents of change. Um, the anti-bias workshops and curriculum for teachers um, are where teachers explore personal identity as a lens for understanding language and culture, examining bias and challenging bias, right? Um, and these workshops are also available for students, but um, we also provide curriculum for teachers as well. Um, additional resources that we have, uh, ADL's website includes a number of different uh, lesson plans, which I find to be fantastic, um, that are timely. Um, so we have one, I think, recently about talking about COVID-19 and the impact it's having in our communities. Um, we have uh, classroom conversations, how to have these difficult conversations in classrooms. Uh, whether it be from immigration to 
uh, you know, school shootings or the, the gun responsibility debate. We have cl classroom conversations that teachers can use for free. And then we have books that, ma books that matter series, right? The books that have potential to create lasting impressions, having the power to instill empathy, affirm children's sense of self, and teach about diversity, really inspire actions of social justice. Um, so what can you do, right? Um, in addition to some of these uh, resources that we provide, you can also advocate, right? Um, you can lobby your elected officials for more resources. Uh, we know, we know um, from studies that have been done that um, an investment in education is one of the best investments that you can make um, it, as a state in terms of economic development and driving, um, you know, a number of different things. So um, lobbying your elected officials for more resources. So obviously Alana talked a little bit about the Holocaust Education Bill of 2019 that was passed last year that's being implemented as we speak. Um, but you know, we were able to do other things like passing hate crimes bill in 2019, right? Where we created a working advisory group. And that working advisory group is examining how are we providing anti-bias curriculum to our school? How are we, how, what are schools doing and what kind of resources do they need? Because we know there is a long checklist of things that educators must meet every year. We have to be able to also do this uh, in a thoughtful way that doesn't add an additional burden to our educators, right? And so, um, again, the Hate Crimes Working Advisory Group is thinking really um, thoughtfully with uh, education thought leaders um, about or across the state about how to do this as well and is going to provide recommendations uh, this summer to the legislature to pass. Obviously, with the COVID-19 crisis, uh, everything is up in the air, but again, we are going to do our best. But being uh, a voice and advocating for um, these kinds of policies um, is important and can create direct, impactful change. Something happens in your school, um, please, please, please uh, feel free to reach out to us, report it to ADL. Um, we have a incident reporting website, and any incident that happens in the five-state region goes directly either to myself or our regional director, uh, Mary Cyphers. Um, and the incident report form uh, will ask you a number of different questions: well, who, what, when, where, why. Um, uploading, your, you have the ability to upload photos. But if you feel like you're getting stonewalled by the administration, if you feel like you know that you need a different level of expertise around bias, incidents, or hate reach out to us. Um, we are happy to talk about um, you know, the, the issue or the incident that may have happened at your school. And we can provide recommendations. We can come in and talk uh, about why this stuff is, is really important and why this context matters. Um, and then and really try to create change. And a number of different schools have reached out to us when they are in crisis or when something happens. Um, in, across their state. And so again, we are happy to work with you. Our director of education um, has several decades of experience um, leading these kinds of programs and having these conversations. And so um, we are happy to um, talk to you about these issues as well. So as I kind of wrap up the conversation or the presentation in itself, uh, you know, the final thoughts in terms of things I would like you the thing about as you leave this presentation is number one, hate is on the rise in the Pacific Northwest. Again, we live in what we think as a uh, diverse and um, inclusive um, state, and a lot of our policies do dictate that, right? But we also see that we are victims uh, of hate, that um, we are not immune to anti Semitism, to bigotry, to these white nationalist groups, these extremist organizations, um, we have as much of a problem as anyone else does, right? And, and it exists here and we cannot deny that reality. We must understand that what's being reported out in the media, what's being reported to us, is a severe undercount of what's actually happening today. Uh, the second is, feel free to utilize our education plan. The Holocaust, uh, Ilana talked a little bit about their educational resources, which are wonderful and I strongly encourage you to, um, you know, check them out as well. Uh, check out ADLs as well. Um, and we have a number of great lesson plans that you can use in our school um, at no cost. And of course, if something happens, report it to us. Report it to ADL because again, uh, we cannot let these inc incidents go unchecked. And so with that, 
I'm going to ask one last question, which is, what will you take away from the conversation today? I'm not sh I don't remember if this is a short answer or a word cloud, but um, feel free to add your thoughts to the chat as I kind of talk a little bit about um, you know, next steps. Um, feel free to reach out to myself at any time. Uh, the next slide will include my email. Um, but again, uh, I, we, uh, ADL appreciates uh, the work that educators do on the front lines every single day um, and how much you put into it. And l just know that we are here to support you as well. So it seems like there are a number of people that appreciate the resources and the lessons and, and uh, you know, again, um, I appreciate you joining today's uh, webinar and happy to take questions at this time. Thanks, Kendall. Thank you. Alana. Thank you so much. Um, we have a questions here, so I'm just going to start um, kind of moving through some of them. I don't know if we'll have time for all of them, but we'll see how many we can get to. The first question that came in um, early on in your presentation was, what percent of reported hate crimes result in a conviction? That's a great question. Uh, I would say very low. Um, it, I, you know, it varies based on the jurisdiction, um, but we know that the number of uh, incidents that are reported, it gets smaller and smaller from the incidents that are reported to the number that are investigated, to the number that are charges are brought to to the number of that are being prosecuted it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller right so i can't give you a necessarily a specific number off the top of my head but i would say that it is not very many because again hate crimes or hate in, hate crimes in particular are very difficult to prove um, because uh, there's a very specific burden of proof that must be met um, to be able to convict them right um, so you oftentimes it has to be as specific as I am attacking you because you are this, and I am specifically doing this because you are this, right? So um, it, it, it's a very difficult burner of proof, and I think um, lawyers will, will talk about that very uh, in very emphatic terms, but again, the number is not nearly high enough, right? And so part of the community's, pre community's responsibility is for, to provide pressure uh, on prosecutors to push them a little bit harder to prosecute these things and take them as seriously as possible. A number of law enforcement agencies don't even recognize um, what, what hate crimes are. They don't have, they have very little training on them, right, in recognizing them. And so, again, um, that's something that we, ADL, is doing actively to work with law enforcement to train them on hate crimes to make them recognize it as a serious problem. Thank you. Um, so another question that we received was, how do percent changes of hate incidents in the Pacific Northwest compare to other geographical regions in the country? That's a great question. Um, so overall across the entire country, I would say that the, the number of hate crimes has uh, significantly increased over the last three years, right? Um, I think there was a little bit of a dip last year compared to the year before, uh, which I, I believe was its highest year ever. Um, but it really depends on the state, right? The 46 states in the entire country have a hate crime law. Four states don't have a hate crime law, which essentially um, is a lack of protections against people of different identities. Uh, and so it really does uh, depend on uh, the state, but we are seeing there is a rise across the country, undoubtedly of anti-Semitism, of uh, bias incidents, uh, and, and there's a recognition that um, extremist organizations in particular um, are a, becoming a major issue, right? Domestic extremism is, is becoming a major priority for the FBI, uh, and the number of arrests that have been made, the number of uh, incidents that have happened um, uh, show that or display that. Thank you. Can you, um, so we had a question about this and I'm wondering, maybe you can talk a little bit more about why Washington State is so high on the list for these kinds of crimes. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think a number of different things. Uh, I think that Washington State in particular has uh, pretty good reporting overall uh, compared to other states. 
the majority of the incidents that are reported to the FBI in Washington State come from King County, uh, in particular Seattle, um, and that's primarily because they have a bias court, a bias a crimes coordinator, um, Detective Waring of the Seattle Police Department, who coordinates all bi bias crimes. No, a lot of other jurisdictions or law enforcement agencies don't have that kind of person. And because they have Detective Waring working on these cases and taking these incidents seriously, um, the numbers in Seattle are a lot more accurate than other jurisdictions that don't report as many. Um, and again, a lot of law enforcement agencies across the country don't have someone like Detective Waring. And so I think we're very fortunate to have, um, you know, uh, law enforcement that's acutely aware of these issues, right? But it doesn't mean we can't be doing better, right? And, and um, that's why we're working really hard to create a uh, curriculum for law enforcement to learn about hate crimes in particular. And, and how, do we, how do we push them to get that training? And so we're having conversations with, with the Criminal Justice Training Center, which does all the law enforcement training across the country or across the state, um, to, to train them to be better, right? And I think the other thing that makes Washington unique in terms of um, the number of hate crimes that are being reported is the, I, I think the 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 weird uh, environment that we live in that there has been historically a large number of extremist organizations that have called the Pacific Northwest home. Um, again, last year we saw a number of flyers like the ones I showed earlier from the Daily Stormer Book Club. We saw a number of different um, stickers that are being posted around the Puget Sound area from Patriot Front, which is a white supremacist organization. It's just a, a, a state that has a long storied history with extremism. And I think some of that has to do with that as well. Um, and then, of course, lastly, I think the state uh, has a good hate crimes law uh, and that protects a lot of different identities. Uh, for example, uh, Washington State added gender uh, identity last year to its list of protected class uh, uh, protected um, classes but for uh, other states like Wyoming don't have a hate crime law at all right Alaska doesn't include um, protections against uh, or hate crime law doesn't include sexual orientation as a protected class right so how, do, how are we um, trying to protect the vulnerable populations and be really thoughtful about how we're doing that Thank you. Um, so this next question I'm going to read, it says, do you have any suggestions on how to get school staff involved in anti-bias education if they think they are doing enough in their own classes? That's a really good question. Um, I, th I think I a number say... of people probably have that <laughs> same question. Yeah, <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, I had that same question too, but I would say, um, you know, oftentimes schools don't reach out to us unless something actually happens, right? Schools are not necessarily proactive in reaching out to us and being like, We're, I want to do an anti-bias education uh, activity because, uh, because I think that we can be doing more. No, it's usually because a student did something terrible or, you know, something that a swastika was drawn on this tree outside our school and we need to respond to it. It's very uh, reactive versus very proactive, right? And so uh, I think it's a challenge um, in, in any kind of context with anyone, not just schools. Um, but that being said, I think that um, we can always be doing better. I don't have a good answer. I'd have to ask our director of education to provide that, but the best I can say is, uh, you know, pushing as hard as you can and providing why the, why context matters and, and documenting these incidents as they happen is really important uh, to provide ex concrete examples of why this, the, the creating anti-bias leaders is important. Yeah, thank you. Um, one question that's come up a few times from a couple different people is, can we share your PowerPoint after this presentation? Sure. Yeah, um, happy to provide it. Wonderful. Yeah, there's, there's lots of great resources in there. So we'd like to be sure that, that we share that. Um, yeah. Okay, I've, I've got an, another question here, which um, we'll see if you feel willing to answer it. And that is, 
do you feel like the state attorney general is sufficiently sensitized to how bad the situation is in Washington state? Uh, uh, that's a great question. Um, I would say yes. Um, uh, our attorney general actually leads the hate crime working advisory group uh, for Washington state. They staff it and dedicate resources and time to it. So I think that they're taking it very seriously, also because it's mandated by the legislature, but also because I think they take it very seriously um, as an issue, right? And, I, and again, uh, the values in which the state um you know really puts credence on uh is shown through the actions of the legislature last year in terms of passing not only the hate crimes law but also the holocaust education bill right and i think um you know showing that leadership is really important um and so that being said we are not afraid to hold the attorney general's feet in the fire if we need to right and, and if they don't we don't think they're doing a sufficient job then we will let it be known and i think uh, again, the, this working advisory group is a good first step. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Kendall. Are there any last parting words that you want to share with this group? Um, sure. So uh, again, I appreciate everyone's willingness to attend today. Uh, I know that educators' time is precious and y'all are very busy and you're facing a lot of different challenges. And so, um, Again, if you ever have the need, feel free to reach out uh, if you have any questions or you're looking for resources or whatever it is. My, my email, I typed it into the chat just a little bit ago. It's kkosai at adl.org. Um, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that folks may have or direct you on to our director of education, who uh, her name is Scott, Scotty Nash, um, who's been uh, an educator for several decades and she is happy to work with any school on any initiative and any issue that they may have. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk today uh, and I hope that folks uh, really take something away from this. For sure. Kendall, you've given us so many great resources and statistics that we can build from. Um, Definitely, I encourage you to reach out to Scotty Nash at the ADL. Also, if you're interested in some of their teaching resources, they have a lot available. Um, and if you're looking for additional things, of course, please always check out the Holocaust Center's website. We have lots of online materials right now and upcoming programs and lots of speakers coming up as well. So thank you so much, Kendall, for joining us today and spending part of the afternoon with us. Thank you to all of you educators um, for taking time out of your afternoon to join this important presentation. Uh, if you hold on just a moment, I'll be putting up a link in the chat with the, um, with the uh, survey to fill out for this workshop. It just helps us to figure out what's meaningful to you and what's working and what else you'd like to see going forward. We'll also email that out to everybody afterwards, along with information about clock hours, if that's something that you want. So thank you so much, and uh, feel free to email us anytime. Thank you.